I hope that's okay. Everybody is it. Cool. Uh, hello, good evening. If you are in Europe, uh, my name is uh, Stefan Prodan, and I'm a developer uh, experience engineer at WeWorks. And for the last couple of years, I've been a Flux maintainer, and I'm also working on a tool called Flagger that fits in the same uh, space um, around continuous delivery. So today I want to share with you the evolution of Flux, how it started here at Weaveworks and how it's evolving into version two, which uh, I guess you heard about. <laughs> so uh, like all CICD stories, uh, it starts with this, uh, have your app repo, everything is in there. You have manifests, Docker files, and if you, uh, if you're, you've done that like four or five years ago, there was no Helm, no customized, no nothing. So you'll be running probably a Jenkins server, um, build your image, then do a replace inside your manifests to set the image tag, or maybe even worse, you push the latest image and then you uh, add a, I don't know, a label or an annotation on your pod. So the pod restarts and Kubernetes will pull the, uh, Pull the last, latest version. And this worked for us for, for a bit. Uh, then we decided that this kind of approach has, uh, uh, has major limitations. Uh, for once, it works if you have a single app and you place all things in your, uh, in your repo here, let's say the namespaces, maybe an ingress controller and everything else that your app needs. Uh, but if you have more than one app, then where you place all these shared manifests. Also, what happens if, let's say you deploy the app, everything works fine. And after a minute or two, uh, the app runs into a problem or a bug. How do you roll back? Um, with such a pipeline, you'll have to maybe rerun the previous job, produce a new image and deploy the old code this way. Or you go into the cluster and, um, manually change back the, the image tags and everything else. So as you can imagine, if you have hundreds of apps, um, this approach uh, has a lot of issues. Also, if you are targeting more than one cluster, every time you add a new cluster to your fleet, you have to go into your uh, CI CD pipelines, add the new cluster there with um, a cube config uh, and so on. So if someone hacks your, your CI CD system, then yeah, they have control over your production system as well, not only your pipeline. So to improve this, we, uh, we made a decision to uh, break CI from CD. So CI, it's about test, build and push. Um, it stops at, um, pushing the container image uh, in Docker Hub or any other container images that you, you may use. Uh, the important bit here is that you should produce immutable uh, images on every, uh, on every job run. How you can do that? You can use the Git SHA or the Semver if you are uh, building a release and never uh, push over uh, an image that was um, stored in, in your registry. Now, once you no longer do the testing uh, on the Kubernetes cluster in here, you may wonder like, how can I ensure it will not fail on the cluster? There are, there are a couple of um, solutions. What we use in the Flux organization for Flagger and many other uh, projects, uh, we uh, spin up a Kubernetes kind cluster inside GitHub Actions or inside CircleCI or whatever CI platform we are using. So we spin that there. Uh, we deploy our app inside the Kubernetes clusters that's running in, uh, in the CI uh, VM and we uh, do the end-to-end -end tests there. Um, it's one solution I'm not saying is perfect. It works great for us, um, but you may actually want to spin up uh, I don't know, ephemeral clusters to do this kind of testing if uh, kind is not uh, good for you. Okay, so this is how CI works. 
Um, and for continuous delivery, we, uh, we made the decision to run the continuous delivery logic and everything that, uh, uh, that implies managing the release inside the cluster. So CI stays outside, but for uh, continuous delivery, we move that inside the cluster. And this gives us a um, couple of advantages. Um, if you add a new cluster to your fleet, and let's say that cluster uh, has to deploy the same thing, you can just connect it to the Git repo and it will work. Um, other things you can do inside your, uh, your repository, and I'm going to, uh, to demo uh, a couple of uh, repository structures later. You can uh, create customized overlays or hand releases and target different uh, cluster groups, staging, production, development, pre-production, and so on. Um, the advantage of, of this approach is that the cluster uh, is in charge with its own reconciliation. You don't connect it from outside and tell it what to do. The cluster uh, knows what to do based on a, uh, on a Kubernetes controller that's running inside. So that's a major shift in terms of how you um, instrument your, your pipelines. Now, what's running inside the cluster for WeWorks, uh, that's Flux. And I wasn't uh, at WeWorks back then, but Flux uh, started five years or four years ago. Uh, so it's a long time uh, for Flux G1 uh, production usage in, in WeWorks. Uh, this is how Flux version one does cluster management. So you have a, a cluster Git repo that defines the whole state of your cluster. You copy all your manifests from your app repositories uh, in here. You define namespaces, everything else that you need. Then you uh, deploy Flux on your cluster and uh, you configure Flux uh, with a deploy key to connect to your uh, Git repo. And since all the apps manifests are in here, how would you update uh, an app to a new version? And how we, we tried to figure this problem out was for Flux to scan container registries find new images and write back to Git based on a sample expression or a regex or something like that. It will write back to Git um, the new tag. Then another part of Flux will detect that change and apply it. So you can think of Flux as a monolith from that perspective. It does a bunch of stuff besides just uh, applying things on the cluster. It does uh, Git operations, so it, it knows how to connect to Git how to authenticate. It knows how to authenticate to container registries, scan them, um, pulls everything together, then applies it. Now, later on, uh, Helm uh, became really popular. So um, we decided to create uh, an operator for Helm that will deal with Helm in a native way. So we could just use Flux v1 and um, you know call inside Flux Helm template, get the YAMLs like Argo and uh, other solutions are doing and apply that YAML. Um, we thought that we want to give the Helm users a full Helm uh, user experience uh, when they do GitOps. So that's why we chose to build a dedicated thing called Helm operator and Helm operator will uses um, existing Helm packages, Golang packages, and does the same stuff as you would uh, do with the Helm CLI in terms of installing, upgrading, testing, rollback, all these operations are expressed in a custom resource. That custom resource can be placed in a Git repo. From there, Flux uh, will um, apply the, the Helm release custom resources uh, in your cluster. Helm operator will uh, react to those changes. And what Helm operator does, it connects, it connects back to Git. In some cases, if you store your charts there, pulls the charts uh, inside its own uh, container, um, builds the charts and uh, builds the chart and applies it. Or you can uh, configure Helm operator to connect to a Helm repository, pull the index from there, pull the chart and apply the release. So as you can see, there are a couple of overlaps here. Uh, 
in terms of operations. Uh, if you use the same Git repository to store your charts and also all your manifests, then inside your cluster, that particular repository will be pulled twice by Flux and by Helm operator. And Flux version one is limited to a single Git repo. It cannot connect to more than, uh, than one. Uh, while Helm operator can connect to more than one, but uh, you have to configure uh, known hosts. You have to mount files inside the Helm operator uh, uh, container to uh, give him um, the SSH keys and configure the right authorization for it. Also for uh, Helm rep repositories, it was the same. You had to uh, create the uh, repositories.yaml, set there all your uh, secrets and mount that file inside Helm operator. So having this um, running in production for, uh, I don't know, Helm operator is close to two years now, one year at least. Uh, we decided, hey, we need to come up with a new thing where these two controllers don't have to um, do the same operations twice. So while um, thinking about that with, with uh, the other Helm uh, uh, Flux maintainers, uh, we come up with a solution that manages uh, sources. And we call that source controller. So we've built this thing as the first uh, step towards uh, Flux version two. We didn't know where we'll get back then. So we built this controller that uh, based on uh, custom resource definitions, and it comes right now with three of them, a kid repository, a Helm repository, and a bucket. Um, it knows how to connect to all these um, storage solutions. It will pull the manifest from there it will create an artifact inside the cluster so other controllers can consume it. And while we were working on source controller, we, um, we came up with the idea to create an SDK. And the name of the SDK is GitOps Toolkit. What this means is that we've built um, Golang packages and specialized tools like Kubernetes controllers um, that work nicely together uh, using uh, Kubernetes events and using custom resource definitions. They have no HTTP API. You uh, drive the operations uh, through the Kubernetes API. And uh, we, we decided to write these controllers with um, Kubernetes upstream libraries instead of doing what we did in Flux. Back then when we, when we started Flux, there was no custom resource definition. There was no operator con concept. Um, things have evolved a lot in the last four years. So uh, in, inside the Kubernetes project, there is a, um, a library called controller runtime, which offers a lot of um, good libraries. So you can, you can build controllers uh, easily and uh, in according to, to upstream. So we adopted this uh, framework and we, we developed our own uh, SDK for it. So we have source controller built in that way. And then instead of rewriting Flux version one, Helm operator to use source controller, we, we decided to uh, go forward with the refactoring and rewrite uh, all these uh, specialized controllers with control runtime library. So, Instead of rewriting Flux V1, we created a customized controller, which is uh, the controller that applies plain YAMLs or uh, customized overlays. And instead of Helm op operator, we now have Helm controller, which is specialized on Helm operations. And we are working right now on a, on a set of controllers that will deal with the image update feature. So a lot of people asked us for, for Flux V1, hey, can I? Can I scan for registries on a different cluster and write to Git then some other Flux instances from other um, um, clusters could, could reconcile and so on. So that wasn't possible because you cannot tell Flux, hey, just scan a, a library um, a container registry. Now that we have these dedicated controllers, you can run these controllers uh, wherever you want. Uh, and there is no uh, tight coupling between them. 
So you can run the image update controllers on your management cluster. They will take care of all your repos and then um, the production clusters will detect the changes and apply it, for example. The idea behind uh, the GitOps toolkit is that all these controllers are working together. So if we put all the things uh, inside the cluster, we get Flux version two. So Flux version two is made out of source controller. We manage uh, uh, Helm repositories, Git repositories, S3 compatible buckets. Um, then based on those sources, you can configure customized controller and Helm controller to reconcile your cluster state. So this is the part, the reconciliation part. And also in, in Flux version one, a lot of people asked us, hey, we, we want more, uh, more insight in what's going on. Uh, we don't want to tail the logs every time something uh, goes wrong. We want to, to get a, a clean picture of, of what's happening. So in order to do that, we, we created yet another controller, which is called notification controller. And notification controller deals with incoming events and outgoing events. Uh, incoming events means uh, webhooks. Let's say you do a git commit and you don't want to wait for Flux um, to um, detect the commit in five minutes, 10 minutes, or however long you've set the reconciliation loop. Um, notification controller um, has a custom resource definition called receiver, and you can create receivers for GitHub, GitLab, um, Harbor, and even Jenkins, doesn't matter what. It will bind to a load balancer or an ingress controller. It will validate um, the payload using HMAC, and you can tell notification controller, hey, create listen for events for this particular repo and when it changes let know the reconcilers about that change so let's say you do a git push that changes a helm release file a notification controller uh, receives the um, the payload from github then it will tell source controller hey there is a change source control will actually pull uh, the new revision inside the cluster and then we'll trigger an event for customized controller and helm controller. Customized controller say, hey, there is a new revision. I have to apply it on the cluster and it will apply the helm release. Helm controller will uh, detect that, hey, a helm release has changed. I have to upgrade it. And if the upgrade succeeds or fails, it will issue a Kubernetes event. Notification controller then can capture that event using uh, a different custom resource called alert where you can say, if that particular hand release, let's say the Nginx ingress controller hand release uh, issues any kind of events, I want these events to be forwarded to Slack, Microsoft Teams, or uh, there are other options here. Uh, I want that event to be forwarded. So uh, the team that's in charge of that particular um, application can see what changed, if it failed, and if it failed, why it failed. For example, we will tell you that a particular Helm test fail or um, customized controller will, will tell you that your YAMLs is, is not valid or maybe didn't pass uh, uh, an admission webhook and so on. So you get visibility out of what's happening inside your cluster. And in terms of observability, we, uh, we've added more things uh, to Flux because yeah, people ask about that a lot. Um, first of all, now you have custom resources to define a source, to define how your cluster gets reconciled and so on. So you can do um, kubectl get, kubectl describe, and for each thing, for example, for Helm release, uh, in the, when you do kubectl get, it will tell you uh, if it's reconciled at what version, and if it fails, it will also tell you the, uh, the error message. We also added health checks to, uh, to the reconciliation loop. So for example, in, in with, uh, with customized controller, you can uh, tell it to check for, uh, uh, after it applies the change to check for uh, the health check of deployments, of stateful sets, Helm releases, and many other custom resources that uh, report the uh, ready status. Um, a lot of custom resources out there are compatible with, uh, with our health checks. We, we haven't 
invented <laughs> health checks. Uh, we are using uh, a library from, uh, from uh, Kubernetes upstream called case status, which was developed inside uh, the customized project that uh, knows how to wait for a resource and report if it uh, reconciles successfully or not. So if your custom resource is compatible with case status, it will also work with Flux version two. As I said before, we expose Kubernetes events for everything that's happening. We also expose Prometheus metrics and those metrics are compatible with Prometheus Alert Manager. So you can also use those metrics and trigger alerts to PagerDuty and other uh, alerting systems that we don't support with notification controller. And we export metrics uh, for each custom resource. So um, you get the same uh, alert through, through a Prometheus uh, metric, the same that you get through our notification controller. For example, if, if a reconciliation has failed or if a Helm release upgrade has failed or a Helm test and so on. Um, we also made uh, Grafana dashboards based on these metrics. Uh, and there, is, uh, there are documentation on how you can install it. It's very simple. And of course we have Slack, Microsoft Team, Discord and so on uh, supported by by our own notification controller. Now let's talk about multi-tenancy. So because we, in Flux version one, we had this limitation where uh, a Flux instance, a Flux pod can only connect to a single tree repo. If you want to uh, add more repositories to your uh, cluster, let's say you have a repository per team, then you have to install one Flux instance in that team namespace and that Flux instance will connect to the team repo. And this works well, uh, unless you want to use app repositories and not team repositories. And if you have hundreds of apps, then you have to install Flux hundreds of times. So you can see that this, this works for, for team management, but not for uh, distributing configuration across app repos. And we, we really wanted to, to enable this, uh, this use case. So what we did in, uh, in, in version two, we have um, two ways of doing multi-tenancy. Uh, one, one way of doing it uh, and works well for organizations where the dev team collaborates with the team that's in charge of, of the clusters, I don't know, operations team, SRE team, however you want to call it, platform team. Uh, the idea is uh, that every time you want to add an app repository or your team repository and you want to change the, the cluster state, uh, let's say you, oh, you want to deploy things to a particular namespace, you will be opening a pull request on the fleet repository where the operation people will assign uh, an app uh, to a service account, to a Kubernetes service account. And once that gets merged, then the app repository will be reconciled on the cluster, but that uh, will be reconciled using that service account. So Flux version two knows how to impersonate service accounts and with service accounts and uh, Kubernetes RBAC, you can uh, restrict what a particular uh, repository can change inside your cluster. So you can assign uh, a team to multiple namespaces and bind that uh, service account to all those namespaces, or you can create a service account per app and uh, restrict what the uh, app manifests can change inside your cluster. The problem with this approach is that when you do multi-tenancy like this, you enforce uh, the people in charge with the apps to open pull requests on the fleet repo and if they can open pull requests, then they can see the content of the fleet repo. So they will be aware of other teams and other apps that are running on your cluster because the whole uh, state is declared there. Maybe they, they cannot see the actual manifest, that, but they will know um, what other repos are being reconciled. Now, if you are a platform vendor, you don't want your tenants to know about each other. So in order to solve this problem, what we are working on right now, so this is currently uh, uh, not released. We are working on this uh, multi-tenancy for platform vendors approach where 
uh, instead of developers um, or people that are responsible for app repository, instead of them opening pull requests on the fleet repo, here, the um, platform team, they are going to add a tenant repository to their fleet repo. Then developers will add their apps to the tenant repo. So a tenant cannot see what other tenants are running on the cluster. And in order to um, enforce this, we are going to use Kubernetes users and we are going to automatically create a users for each tenant. And when you add a tenant repo, a tenant definition, a tenant repo to your, your fleet repository, that user will get automatically assigned. So you as a tenant, even if you want to escape, you want to bind to another user or to another service account, it will not be possible. Everything that's reconciled from that tenant repository or any apps repositories that are added to that tenant will run under that particular uh, user. So it's very similar to the service account approach, but it's, uh, it's more, uh, it's hidden in a way and it's enforced by default. Okay, so that was my uh, presentation. If you have questions uh, about Flux version two, um, we are using GitHub discussions to collect feedback. Uh, if you also have proposals like, okay, I, I envision Flux, uh, I want to use Flux to do this particular thing and it doesn't uh, do it right now. This is how I want it to be. Uh, you can create such proposals uh, also here in the, in the GitHub discussions. So please, uh, please join us and uh, let's work together on, on Flux 2. Okay, that was my presentation. I'm going to uh, do a demo. Uh, so we've made this repository inside the Flux CD org um, to give people um, an example of, of how they can structure uh, their uh, fleet repo and target multiple clusters. And in this particular example, uh, is around uh, using Helm and Helm charts uh, to compose the cluster state. And first of all, I'm going to fork this. Oh, I already forked it. Okay. One second, I'm going to delete it. Okay. GitHub is very slow today, or maybe it's Zoom. Um, Okay, let's try this again. Fork. No. Okay, I'm going to use this one. Doesn't matter really. Uh, so Flux comes with a new CLI. We made a new CLI for Flux version two. In Flux version one, it was called uh, Flux Control, Flux TL. Um, the new CLI is called simply Flux and you can install it from Brew or uh, other package managers. Uh, we are also um, trying to make it compatible with Windows. So what, the, what Flux can do for you, the new CLI is streamline the whole uh, bootstrap experience. Um, you, it works with GitHub, GitLab, um, and we are looking at adding Bitbucket support uh, if you are using a Git provider that's not in this list, you can follow the manual instructions. But and we are we also have a, a Terraform provider that does the same thing for the bootstrap. So with with the Terraform provider, you can you can do whatever you want. 
This is an opinionated way of how to install Flux uh, on a cluster. So first let's look at my cluster. Here namespaces. It's a clean cluster, have nothing in there. So with, command, with this command, um, if you give it your uh, GitHub token, Flux will uh, create a repository for you. If one doesn't exist, will push all, all its install manifest to that repo. It will create a deploy key for you and then will connect the target cluster um, to that repo. So, So this repo is structured like this. I have my app definitions. I have my infrastructure layer that has Nginx uh, ingress controller, has a Redis cluster, have some source definitions. And uh, in here, in my uh, apps there, I have a Helm, a Helm release for my app. Then I have overlays for production and staging. So I'm changing things between, uh, um, between clusters. And now I'm going to provision the, uh, the staging cluster and uh, I'm going to tell Flux Bootstrap, hey, this is where you should uh, uh, look for to synchronize this particular cluster. This is a path inside uh, the repo. I'm going to run this command. And what happens now, FluxTL has pulled all the manifests from our latest uh, release on GitHub. Uh, it has committed all these manifests to our repo. And now it's uh, applying uh, for the first time the whole uh, GitOps toolkit controllers, custom resource definitions, uh, network policies, and everything that's needed to, uh, uh, to create the installation. Okay, bootstrap finish. Now, if we look at the repo, refresh here, we're going to see um, two commits. So first commit that Flux made with my token, that's why it's my name here. Um, this commit adds the install manifest. So the flux system namespace, as I said, network policies, custom resource definition, RBAC, everything that flux needs. Then there is a, a second commit that contains uh, two custom resources. One, it's called the Git repository. And this is how I'm adding this particular repo to the cluster using uh, uh, the SSH address, Flux has generated uh, an SSH deploy key for me, has added that key to GitHub. And what this manifest does, it tells Flux, hey, I want to register this Git repo at this branch inside the cluster. So nothing gets applied from that repo. It only uh, pulls the, uh, the manifest inside the cluster, that's it. Now, if you want to configure how manifests are getting applied, you have to create uh, this uh, custom resource called customization, which is, you can think of it as the uh, server side version of your customization object uh, that configures customize itself. And in this custom resource, I have a path where I'm telling Flux, hey, apply all the manifests from here on this cluster. And where are those manifests are in this source called flux system type uh, Git repository. So the one that we've uh, created here. So based on these two, uh, based on this configuration as a whole, uh, this is the equivalent of installing flux version one uh, using command flags where you specify your Git repo, your path and, and all of that. <clears throat> you can modify these custom resources and Flux version will reload it and will uh, apply the new config. You don't have to restart it or redeploy it or anything like that if you want to change uh, anything in here, let's say the branch or um, other things. 
Okay, so now if I'm looking at my cluster, with the Flux CLI, I can do get sources git, and it will tell me all the sources that are registered on my cluster of type git repository this time. So I see I have a registered Flux system, and this is the commit that uh, is has been pulled inside the cluster. Now I can inside inside my repo I also defined helm repositories so i can do get sources helm and i've defined um, two helm repositories one for the binami uh, repo and uh, another one for a demo app pod info that's uh, a repository hosted on github on my own account Now, this is how you can query sources and see what's going on with them. Uh, you can also uh, see um, the reconciliation uh, configuration and how that it's, uh, is doing. So I can do flux get customizations first. And you can see that I have uh, the system one that installs flux itself and everything else. And then there are uh, two different customization. One is the infrastructure one, and one is the, for the applications. And yeah, the infrastructure and applications contain Helm releases. So I can do get Helm releases. And this time I'm going to look at all the namespaces. And I see that uh, Helm controller has uh, detected and installed uh, three releases for me. Um, the Redis cluster in its uh, own namespace, demo app in its own namespace, and Nginx in Motors controller in its own namespace. So how did I configure all of that? Let's go back to the repo and uh, browse a little. So let's start with uh, infrastructure. Here in the infrastructure directory, I have defined uh, my components. If we look at the Nginx one, um, it has a namespace definition, and then it has a Helm release definition. And this Helm release definition, I can override the default values with everything I want. I can uh, pin to a particular version of Nginx. It's not a good idea to automatically update this one. Uh, breaking changes can happen. So uh, for infrastructure items, I would say uh, uh, do the upgrade manually. And you can see here that the Helm release source is a Helm repository and that's Bitnami, which uh, is in the Flux system namespace. So if we go here at sources, in the Bitnami definition, it's very simple. We have a Helm repository we give it the uh, binami URL and we uh, we tell Flux, hey, every uh, half hour, uh, go to binami and check uh, if uh, new things have have been added to that uh, repo. And I also have my own Henry repo story, which is on GitHub pages. Now, I have this infrastructure and. I, I want to think of infrastructure as a layer that I want to apply on the cluster. So I have all these separate definitions for Nginx, for Redis, for sources and so on. But I want for my infrastructure items to be uh, reconciled on the cluster before my applications. So how can I do that? Inside my cluster definitions, if I'm going to um, staging, I see here that I have um, two custom resources. One is infrastructure, which is a customization with, which tell Flux, hey, install everything in infrastructure. And now I have this custom resource that represents all my infrastructure items inside my cluster. What can I do with it? I can use it when I define how my applications are being reconciled and say my apps that are in this case um, uh, comes from a customized overlay called staging because this is the staging cluster. But before I'm telling Flux, before you try to apply or upgrade any kind of apps, make sure that 
the infrastructure layer is up and running and is healthy. One good example of why you need this kind of uh, dependencies between uh, um, layers uh, of manifests. Uh, let's say you, you have, um, you use the service mesh, let's say you use Linkerd and you want to deploy your apps uh, on the cluster. When you first create the cluster, if you would apply the Linkerd Helm chart and all your apps at the same time, there is a great chance that some of your apps will start before uh, Linkerd has the chance to set up its own injection webhook. Using the dependency, you can say, all my apps depend on Linkerd. Linkerd has to be up and running and you can also define a health check for, uh, for their injection webhook. And you can say, boost, uh, install these apps on the cluster only if the, uh, only if the Linkerd injector is up and running. Dependencies work also between um, Helm releases. So with customizations, you can define your layers and dependencies between layers. And with Helm releases inside each layer, you can define de dependencies between them. So you can say things like, when I'm upgrading my app and my database, I want first for my uh, database Helm chart to be upgraded that to succeed and only then upgrade my app. So it, it works at bootstrap time, but it also works at uh, upgrade time. So it gives you more flexibility uh, if your app have uh, interdependencies. And maybe your app doesn't have that. Maybe you do microservices only and everything run on its own. But when you deal with uh, Kubernetes custom resource definitions versus custom resources, and when you deal with uh, mutation webhooks or validation webhooks, you want those first before anything else. And this is how you can express it uh, in, in Flux version two. Do I still have time? Tamo? Okay, I have 15 more minutes and I want to show you how, how to structure uh, the apps. So for this example, I'm, I'm using uh, plain customized overlays, what I, but with Helm releases. So here in, in the base directory, I have my app uh, pod info and how I'm defining my app. I'm defining my app by creating a namespace where that app will be deployed and a helm release for it. And in the helm release, I'm setting here values that are uh, common for all my clusters. Doesn't matter if it goes on staging or if it goes on production, uh, the Redis cluster is here and I'm using Nginx as my ingress controller everywhere. Now, for differences between clusters, you can create overlays with, with the name of the cluster. That's a good option. So let's say for staging, I have a hand release patch that only specifies the fields that are different from uh, the, the base one. So here for uh, my staging cluster, I want to deploy any Helm release um, uh, alpha, beta, or pre-releases, right? Um, I want to use my staging cluster as a testing ground. And every time I'm doing a pre-release, I want that uh, chart to be deployed here. And since, since this is a staging cluster, the host name, how my app gets exposed outside the cluster is definitely different from the uh, production cluster. So here I'm uh, setting a different uh, host name for my ingress. With, uh, with this expression, what Flux will be doing, because I have here uh, the server uh, in with a pre-release format, it will look for any pre-releases. So it doesn't matter if I am at version 5000 minus alpha one, if that's the latest thing that you've pushed to your Helm repository, it will uh, pull and deploy that one. Now, <clears throat> you may wonder, should I build a Helm uh, chart and push a new Helm chart every time I'm doing a commit into a future branch? I think yes, I think you should do it. But if you don't want to do it, 
and you want to override some uh, um, Helm chat release in your Helm repository, uh, someone contributed uh, recently a feature to, uh, to source controller where source controller will, will pull the, uh, the latest versions, but it will also order them by timestamp. So it will detect if a new version is newer, even if you didn't change the version. But you shouldn't do that. You should uh, bump the, the chat version in CI and, and push a new chat every time. So to resume, my staging cluster can deploy uh, pre-releases. If, if I'm going into my production um, overlay, now here I have a sample expression without uh, uh, without including pre-releases. So what that means is that only stable versions will be deployed on my production cluster. And of course, here I'm changing the host name. This is not something specific to Flux itself, how, how you can patch all these things. This is uh, uh, purely a customized uh, feature. And if we look here in the customization.yaml, which is the customized config, uh, we use the base uh, app definition, then we patch our hand release with, uh, with our uh, production values. Now, if I go here into staging, and let's see what version am I here. 503 is the latest. Let's say I want to do a manual rollback of this. I'm going to do five, so two, going to enable testing and you'll see why. So this enables Helm tests. Going to commit these changes. Now, what I can do, I can tell uh, Flux, instead of waiting one minute or I don't remember the default, I can tell Flux to reconcile uh, my git source called flux system. So it will pull the whole thing. Okay, I've done that. Um, let's look now at uh, customizations. So I'm at ACD. Let's see what's my latest commit here. It's ACD, so it has uh, synchronized everything. Now, if we look at um, Helm releases, we see that, oh, we have a problem. Uh, we didn't manage to downgrade to 502. Why? Because the Helm test failed. So what this means, means that we tried to apply a, a new version, but we told uh, Helm controller, hey, run the tests after you apply it. And if it doesn't work, roll it back. So what Helm controller did, run the test, applied 502, it had run the tests, the test has failed. It told us that the test has failed and it rolled back um, automatically for me. You can, you can configure it to not roll back and so on. You have many, many options here. But this is a, a feature of, of Helm controller where you can, you can tell it to roll back. It will also roll back, for example, if your chat has a deployment inside and that deployment fails. Why? Because Helm itself, after it does an upgrade, checks for all the health checks of, of deployment, stateful sets and so on. And Helm controller makes use of that. So, um, and it will also tell you why it failed. And this is, uh, this will end up on Slack, uh, Microsoft Teams or whatever you are using. This is also Kubernetes event and so on. So you have, let's say maximum visibility, why? a release failed and so on. Now, of course I can um, roll back um, through Git, get to the old version and so on. So this is, this is an example of how a change affects the cluster. It failed for some reason. And instead of you know, leaving that particular instance that was failing, we roll it back automatically. Now this is a, a, a future uh, dedicated for, for Helm itself. If you want to do rollbacks of uh, plain um, I don't know, Kubernetes deployments and so on, uh, customized controller has no such future. So this is something for, uh, for Helm on its own. 
but how if you want to do uh, controlled rollbacks and have the uh, rollback decision based not only on uh, is my um, pod working or not. Maybe you want to take into account metrics. Maybe you want to take into account uh, SLOs uh, or what actual users are experiencing with your new version. Um, you can add Flagger to Flux version two. And with Flagger, you can uh, define a, a policy for, uh, for releases where you can say, um, deploy this new Helm release, but route only 10% of the users to the new version, wait 10 minutes, see, collect metrics, what's happening with that 10% of, of, of your users, are they encountering 500 errors or maybe 404s, uh, or maybe the app is very slow and uh, uh, request latency is very high, maybe the app, app responds in I don't know, one second, two seconds, three seconds, and so on. And based on that information that Flagger can collect from Prometheus, Datadog, CloudWatch, and, and other systems, it can take the decision based on your uh, uh, SLO to roll it back or not. And um, I am very happy to let you know that we made the proposal, the Flux maintainer, uh, the Flagger maintainers made a proposal to the uh, Flux CD team and CNCF to move Flagger in under Flux CD org um, and add Flagger to the Flux family make Flagger one of, of these uh, specialized controllers and uh, bring all these tools uh, into the same family and make them work uh, work better. I, I imagine, for example, in the future, Flagger will be using notification controller to issue the same events and so on. Um, maybe uh, other controllers uh, from Flux will do automatic rollback also in Git based on, uh, on the Flagger analysis and so on. And so I'm, I'm very excited for next year, what's, uh, uh, what we have planned for, for Flux. We are also working on a image update feature. So if you are uh, depending on that for version one, we'll have something by the end of the year so you can uh, play with it. And uh, probably early next year, we'll, have, um, we'll integrate the uh, image controllers inside Flux uh, CLI and you'll be able to deploy the whole thing. Um, like I've shown you today. And that was it. Come on in. Love it, love it. Good stuff, as always. We have, we have a load of questions for you. Are you ready? Ready. <laughs> wait, wait, before the questions. So we have a major uh, mental issue, the flux maintainers. We, we, we created a new repo for Flux. So it's Flux 2, it's no longer Flux. Uh, it has so less stars than the other one. So if you like what, what you are seeing, please go to GitHub, click on that star uh, button and make us uh, feel better. Thank you. Need stars, we need stars. And we're also hiring, just as a heads up. So, so folks wanna join, join the WeaveWorks family, we are hiring. <laughs> Check out our, our, our hiring page. Yeah, yeah, about, about that. We so, also need stars there. <laughs> yeah, we are um, with, with the flagger move inside uh, Fluxidiorg and CNCF. We are looking for an um, engineer to help us uh, move flagger forward. Uh, so, if you want to work on open source stuff, you like service meshes, um, you have knowledge about ingress controllers, and you, you really love this stuff. Uh, Please reach out to us on Slack, and I'm I'm very happy to to explain what what this job means. But in the end, it means uh, working on on Flagger and Flux together. That's it. Okay, let's go with the questions. More plugs. So since since if you if you're interested in spending some money, we we also sell we also sell software as well. So <laughs> <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Or if you need help, you can beg us to help you. We will be happy to. <laughs> so, um, so I'll jump in. I, I have a quick question. They, they're saying uh, for notification controllers, 
um, concerned in flux events, not Prometheus alerts. Do you manage targets, teams, alerting services natively with flux CRDs? There seems to be some overlap with, uh, with alert manager receivers. Yes, there is overlap with the alert manager receivers and I'm going to show you what we support right now. So this is the docs website. Uh, we have notification controller and here are, we have documented each custom resource because there are a bunch of them. So um, if we go here to receiver, we see that we support a couple of things. Um, these are the webhooks. The providers are um, those, let's say, overlap with other manager, these ones, but we also write back to the Git status. So that's something that other manager will never do. What, what we are doing here, let's say you do a commit in your GitHub repo, you change something, that change gets applied on the cluster, maybe it fails, we'll write back to that particular Git status inside your Git repo, and it will tell you that it failed. So you can, like with CI, you look at your commits and you'll see a red dot, hey, this commit has failed, and this is why. Um, another reason we can we cannot use Alert Manager uh, for uh, reconciliation events is the fact that we attach in the event body the, uh, the diff that happened on the cluster. So we'll tell you, hey, from 100 YAMLs, only three changed. Or from 1,000 objects, these kind of objects change and these objects got deleted and so on. This is not, it's not that kind of information that you can put in, in Prometheus. Prometheus is not made for, I don't know, log aggregation and so on. But of course, you can say this has an overlap with, let's say, CloudWatch. They can crawl all the uh, Flux version two logs, extract all those information from there and uh, let you know on Slack and so on. Um, we, we, build, we build this because a lot of Flux version one users wanted this kind of, of future and not depend on third party uh, things. So that's why we build it. And of course the Git commit status uh, updates are, are something that no alert system can do. Is there a way that Git repositories are refreshed on GitHub uh, webhook rather than pulled on a certain timing? Yes. So with this receiver uh, custom resource, this is what you can do. You can create a receiver of type GitHub. Um, you can subscribe to the push event. Um, here is your secret for, for the token. And then you can say, for this particular receiver, I want to refresh these objects, a Git repository or a, a Helm repository. In this example, let's say you are using your Git repo for both raw manifests and you also use something like GitHub pages to store your uh, Helm charts. So from one single repo, you want to trigger uh, um, two things. One, pull all my uh, playing YAMLs, let's say your, your namespace, if that changes and your helm release, then pull the actual chart itself from, from GitHub pages. So you can, uh, Flux version two works no long. So Flux version one was only pull. With Flux version two, it works with push and pull, but the push model is all about letting Flux know and Flux will do the pull for you. So that's, that's how it works. Got another interesting question here. Uh, any gotchas to be aware of when deploying Flux V2 with a self-hosted private GitLab instance? Um, I've been debugging a lot GitLab private instances. Um, there are some issues with, uh, with SSH deploy keys. If you are part of a it's not an organization on GitLab, it's a group. If you are part of a group, um, there are some things that you have to do uh, in order to uh, generate a token so the Flux CLI can create that particular repo. If you get stuck with that, just create the repo on GitLab manually, you create the repo, then you run the Flux bootstrap command and it will work. Um, 
also we we released a couple of days ago a version of the bootstrap where you can tell uh, flux to bootstrap the whole thing using a, a token and no longer an ssh key so you have the choice between ssh key and token so if the ssh key doesn't work token will work for sure uh, if you give it the right access nice I, I still see some questions coming in on YouTube. I'll just remind everyone to make sure that you're joining the community, the WeaveWorks community uh, Slack and, and join the GitOps Days channel. Um, but the, the question from there is, is there any timeline for the image updates release feature? So we have a roadmap that has a progress bar that Bianca made. Uh, the progress bar doesn't show a deadline. And this is open source, there are no deadlines. So I cannot tell you something for sure. Uh, what I can tell you is that you'll be able to test it uh, this month and maybe you are able to use it in production uh, early next year. No promises. That's a good answer, that's a good answer. <laughs> I see another question earlier in the, um, in the Slack conversation. Uh, it's how do you handle GitOps toolkit updates when running several instances in one cluster concerning the CRDs when you update the CRDs in a new version? How would that upgrade process look like? So you'll not be running multiple uh, controllers in your cluster. That's for one. So if, if with Flags V1, you had to do that for each Git repo, is no longer two in Flux version two. So there is a single uh, instance of each controller and the bootstrap command doesn't only install Flux, it also upgrades it. So you do brew upgrade Flux that will uh, pull the latest CLI. Then you run the same bootstrap command. And if something changed, uh, Flux CLI will commit that change to the repo then Flux itself will see, hey, there is a new change. There is a new version of me. It applies that version and it restarts in the new form. So it, it does its own upgrades, does self upgrades. Nice. Very nice. Can the values from the Helm chart be inferred from a different repository other than remote source config maps? So avoiding to fork some charts instead of having them defined directly in the CRD. Hmm. I don't quite get the, the question. Can the values from the Helm chart be inferred from a different repository other than the remote source config maps? Oh, it's another remote source. So it's a different repository, another remote source or config maps. Yes, so you can have values in line uh, in the Helm repository, uh, in the Helm uh, uh, resource uh, manifest, or you can tell Helm controller, hey, for this particular Helm release, go uh, and take the values from a config map or from a secret and so on. So you can create the secrets and config maps in a different repo, add that to the cluster. Customized controller will create those secrets and config maps for you then in your hand release definition, you can reference those files. The only condition here is that the config map, the config maps and the secrets must be created in the same namespace as the hand release. And I know a lot of people uh, were upset by this change, um, but from a multi-tenancy perspective, we cannot allow secrets from, be, from being referenced across namespaces. So you can not say, I want to install this hand release in my namespace, but I want to use a secret from the Flux system namespace. That's not, not possible. And the reason for that is, uh, yeah, multi-tenancy. So an, a new question just came in. It's what's the go-to security container tool these days outside of native ones like GitHub, GitLab users and mindful of things like Dr. Docker bench securities, Snake, Antro, et cetera. Curious to know what the over-indexing choice is here. 
So this will probably be the last question that we have time for. Yeah, so in, in terms of security, I would, I, I just look at um, Kubernetes objects from, that's, that's my perspective of it. I don't care about containers and everything else that should be done in CI. Uh, there are so many solutions out there that can scan containers also in cluster. Um, from a GitOps perspective, I think you should have uh, two types of validation that should also include security features. One, inside your, uh, your Git repo, uh, you should have some kind of uh, static analysis and that can be done with a, with a couple of tools um, that will scan all your manifests and will ensure rules like, do you have limits? Uh, is that container, container uh, running as root? Uh, don't allow that or privilege, sorry. Is that container running privilege? Uh, deny that from being merged into the branch where Flux does it and so on. And on the server side, if you want to enforce policies on Flux, uh, any kind of um, admission webhook and validation webhook will work there. If you use dependencies, you can tell Flux, apply the, let's say, OPA gatekeeper first, then everything else. And if everything else means something that's not conformant, uh, gatekeeper will stop it. Flux will error out and it will let you know, hey, have this problem, uh, you've I don't know, enabled privilege mode on a, on a pod or something like that. Um, one last thing I want to show here in the example repo. So the example repo also comes with a script that validates your, uh, your YAMLs. Uh, it checks if the YAML is actually uh, well formatted, also does a customized build of all your customizations and uses kubeval uh, to validate uh, uh, what's in there. And they are run on any pull request uh, with, with GitHub Actions, but I think uh, we can do that no matter the CI. And you should be doing that even if Flux version two right now, uh, compared to what we did in version one, it doesn't just apply the manifest. First time when it detects a new thing, it will ask uh, the Kubernetes API if the manifests are valid. And it will do a dry run apply first. And only then it will do the actual apply. So you no longer have uh, a state of the cluster where some things from your last commit are applied and some things failed. We, we trigger all these uh, validation webhooks before we try to apply anything. So even if one thing is wrong, then the whole commit will no longer be applied. And this is how uh, with Flux version two, we can ensure a uh, transactional mode from Git to the cluster state. Um, Any other questions? Thank you, Stefan. That was amazing. Thank you very much, Tawani. Yes, yes. And uh...